Miami Book Fair, but just a few minutes ago, Senator Bernie Sanders arrived at the C-SPAN bus, which is parked here on the campus of Miami-Dade College, to do a call-in program to talk about his newest book, Our Revolution, A Future to Believe In. Senator Sanders, you write, this is from page 167, that the Clinton campaign may not have liked it, the Democratic establishment may not have liked it, but it was becoming increasingly clear that I was the strongest candidate if Democrats were to retain the White House. Well, that's what all of the polling showed. Uh, what the polling showed is state by state, in almost all cases, not all, and nationally, I was running uh, better than Secretary Clinton against Mr. Trump, and in some cases by fairly big numbers. The last couple of months on our call-in programs on C-SPAN, we've heard from a lot of Sanders supporters who say, I was supporting Bernie Sanders, but when he dropped out, I'm now supporting Donald Trump. How does that connect? Well, it connects in the sense that an important reality in this country today that media has missed and that many politicians have missed is that a lot of people are in a lot of pain. Uh, we have a middle class which is in decline. You got roughly half of older workers today, Pete, half, who have nothing in the bank as they move into retirement. They're scared to death. You got elderly people cutting their prescription drug pills in half. You got moms out there who can't afford childcare for their, uh, for their kids. Uh, you got kids graduating college today, fifty, hundred thousand dollars in debt, and making twelve bucks an hour, can't pay off. That, that that is a reality which the media has kind of missed and most politicians have kind of missed. It's not a reality that I have missed. And throughout my entire political career, that's what I have been talking about, that there is something fundamentally wrong when in the richest country in the history of the world, which is what we are today, the middle class continues to decline, 43 million people live in poverty, and almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1%, that we're moving toward an oligarchic form of society. And that has been my message. And then Mr. Trump comes along and he says, well, you know, the establishment isn't working. Yeah, you know, I'm a multi-billionaire, says Mr. Trump, but, you know, um, I'm going to take on the establishment. I'm going to take on the politicians, and I'm going to take on Wall Street, and I'm going to take on the drug companies, and I can do it. And, and I'm the only one, by the way, who can do it. And uh, people responded to that. So I think, to Mr. Trump's credit, what he understood is there is a lot of anger and pain and frustration out there. Now, we have a long list of all of the things that Mr. Trump promised during this campaign. And we are going to introduce, I mean, many of these ideas are ideas that I and others have been talking about for a long time. Well, we're going to see to what degree he was telling the American people the truth or to what degree these were simply campaign rhetoric of which he had no intention uh, to fulfill. Uh, but we are going to press him. We're going to introduce legislation, and we hope that he works with us in fulfilling his own campaign promises. Now, Senator Bernie Sanders will be speaking at the Miami Book Fair in about a little over an hour, and we will be covering that live on Book TV. So this is your chance to talk with him. The numbers are on the screen. 202 is the area code 748-8200 for those of you in the East and Central time zones, 748-8201 if you live in the Mountain and Pacific time zones. This is your fourth book. When did you have a chance to write this? <laughs> not much, not much. Uh, I wrote it after the campaign. We took a very little bit of time off uh, after the campaign, and then I spent three months working very long and hard hours uh, on the book. If you had been elected president, and you talk about this in the book, would would you have had to raise taxes for some of the programs that you've Absolutely. advocated for? Absolutely. At a time when you have billionaires like Donald Trump not paying a nickel in federal income tax, at a time when you had major corporation at the major corporation uh, putting their, stashing their profits in the Cayman Islands and other tax havens, and in a given year after making billions of dollars in profits, not paying a penny in federal corporate taxes, of course we can demand that those people pay their fair share of taxes. One of the concerns that I have, and I've said this God knows how many times, is the grotesque level of income and wealth inequality that we have today. You got the top one-tenth of one percent owning almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. Does anybody think that's what America is supposed to be about? Fifty-two percent of all new income today goes to the top one percent. That has got to change. And I will do my best as a United States Senator to make those changes. Page 51 of our revolution. The Clintons over the years received huge amounts of money 
in campaign contributions and speaking fees from powerful financial interests in corporate America. Whether it was on the campaign trail or in their private lives, they spent an enormous amount of time raising money from the wealthy and the powerful. Yes. I don't think that's deniable. But is that the state of the Democratic Party? <laughs> well, that's a good question, Pete. And, and I'm glad you, you brought it there, because that is exactly what I'm working on right now. See, I think that Mr. Trump's many, and most of the people who voted for Mr. Trump, I don't think they're racist. I don't think they're sexist. Uh, I think that they are people in desperation who are hurting. And they are in pain, and they look around, and they say, what is the Democratic Party doing for me? Now, the truth is, and this is an important truth, is that today, after eight years of President Obama, our economy is in much better shape than it was when Bush left office. That's just a fact. When Bush left office, you'll recall that we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. Our world's financial system was on the verge of collapse. We were running up a $1.4 trillion deficit, the largest in American history. Are we better off today? Of course we are. And Obama deserves credit for that. But and here is the very big but, is that while that improvement has taken place, it has not been enough. Too many people are still hurting. You got millions of workers today who in real inflation accounted for dollars are making less than they made 40 years ago. And they're saying, what's going on? Why am I working longer hours for low wages and I'm falling further behind? And they're worried to death about their children. Will their children? ever get a decent job. So those are the, so you know, in my view, Obama has made progress, but not enough. And it is time for the Democratic Party to undergo a fundamental change and decide which side it's on. You can't get money from Wall Street and you can't coddle the pharmaceutical industry. You got to stand with the working families of this country, the vast majority of the people, and tell Wall Street that we're going to break up these large banks, that their greed and illeg illegal behavior is unacceptable. We're going to tell the pharmaceutical industry to stop ripping off the people of this country. Five major drug companies last year made $50 billion in profit, and you got millions of people can't afford the medicine they desperately need. So there's a lot of work that has to be done, but the Democratic Party has to undergo a transformation and make it clear which side you're on. You can't get huge amounts of money from Wall Street and then say, I'm on the side of working families. As a newest member of the Democratic leadership team in the Senate, how will you affect that change? Well, that's what I'm thinking about right now. But what that change will be about, in my view, and what I want to see happen, is the transformation of the Democratic Party to be a party which really is a grassroots party, which opens up its door to working people and says, yes, we know that you can't make it on 10 bucks an hour. We know that you are hurting as your job went to China or to Mexico. We know you can't afford to send your kids to college. Stand with us, be part of us, and open the door to young people. Uh, Peter, if there is anything that uh, impressed me in my campaign is the opportunity to speak to so many very beautiful young people. If anyone watching uh, is pessimistic about the future of this country, above and beyond the recent election, you got to know that there's a generation of young people out there who are very beautiful people, uh, who really love this country, who are going to work hard to make this country become what we know it can become. This is a generation which is the least, the least racist generation, least sexist generation, least homophobic generation in the history of our country. Most, ge the generation most concerned about the environment and climate change. It is a very beautiful group of people, and we want to bring them in to the Democratic Party. Senator Sanders' newest book is called Our Revolution. Here's the cover. Let's hear from Margaret in Leavenworth, Kansas. Margaret, you're on with Senator Sanders. First of all, thank you so much for running. I uh, wore your T-shirt. I had to be in oh. Kansas, and I used to live in uh, Chicago. I was very shocked. You're very wrong, sir, when you say there's not racist and things. Here was like people still talking about Obama as a socialist, a communist, people using religions to hate gays. I was very proud of the two Democrats that won in the Brownback Hostel, Kansas. But my question is, I'm 66. 
I can't hit the streets anymore. I've had breast cancer. I'm so afraid that Social Security and Medicare is going to be taken away, and I don't know how much more poverty I can still manage. The Sisters of Charity helped me here. There's no public transportation. I get $16 of food stamps a month. It's health care that I know is not the greatest. There's nothing, nowhere to go toward the bottom but Margaret, more. Okay. Margaret, let, Margaret me just, thank you. let me just say this. In terms of your first point, I am more than aware that racism uh, and sexism exist in America. My point was that I think that wasn't the dominant reason that Mr. Trump won. But let me get to your second point, and this is an important point. We are going to hold Mr. Trump accountable. You know, he ran for president in the Democrat Republican primary, and he sent out a tweet, if I'm not mistaken, and he said, I am the only Republican candidate. What were this, 19, 17 16. candidates? 16. 16 candidates. I am the only candidate running Republican primary who does not believe that we should cut Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. Donald Trump, I will not cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Now, what Margaret's point is, which is absolutely right, is he got most Republicans out there in the Congress, not all, but most of them do want to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and give huge tax breaks to billionaires. But we are going to hold Trump accountable. We are going to hold him to his word. I myself believe we should expand Social Security because people can't make it on eleven or twelve thousand dollars a year. But we will hold Trump accountable. He said he will not cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and I will do everything that I can to make sure that he does not cut Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. Stephen, Canfield, Ohio, go ahead. Oh. Hey there. Uh, this is a question for Bernie about a uh, third party. Um, Seeing the big business owns two major parties, the Democrats and the Republican parties, I'm just wondering why Bernie's staying with the Democratic Party and not instead helping to lead a movement to form a new party. When you look at... Thank you, Stephen. Oh, Bernie Sanders. Steve, that's a, it's a fair question. And, and I think, uh, as I trust many of the viewers know, I am the longest-serving independent in the history of the United States Congress. I was elected mayor of Burlington, Vermont, as an independent, defeating Democrats and Republicans and so forth. So I know a little bit about it. And what I do know is that it is very, very, very hard to put together a strong third party. And right now, where I am is trying to significantly change and transform and reform the Democratic Party to make it a party of working people of young people, a party which is going to stand up to the fossil fuel industry and Wall Street and the drug companies and the insurance companies. We are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. We should not have to receive calls from people like Margaret who are wondering how they're going to survive on limited amounts of money and Social Security. That's not what this country should be about. So right now that is where I am and I am going to do everything I can to make sure that the Democratic Party has the guts to stand up to the big money interests who have so much power uh, over the economic and political life of this country. But now that you've joined leadership, are you Senator Bernie Sanders D. Vermont or I. Vermont? I was elected as an independent. That's what I am. Iva is in New London, Iowa. Iva, go ahead with your question or comment for Bernie Sanders. Yes, Mr. Sanders, in first place, I don't trust Donald Trump. He lies every breath he takes. And he scares me to death. I think he wants two classes of people, the rich and the poor. And the rich and the poor, that's what they have in communism. Does this frighten you any? Or do you really think that yep. the government can control him? No, he makes me, look, uh, I <laughs> spent the last two weeks of the campaign going to 12 states around this country, including Iowa. Uh, doing my best to see that Donald Trump lost that election. So, of course, he frightens me. And the people that he has around him make me very, very nervous. Uh, but we are where we are right now. Uh, and what I can say is that in a democratic society, people can disagree on a lot of issues. But where there can, in my view, be no comp compromise is on the issue of bigotry. We have a Trump who has a record of having led the so-called Bertha movement, and let's be clear, that so-called Bertha movement was a racist effort to undermine 
the first African-American president in our history. You could disagree with Obama all you want, but to try to undermine his legitimacy through the so-called Bertha movement is grotesque and unacceptable. So we're going to keep our eye on Mr. Trump in terms of his relationship to African-Americans. His ideas and, and the statements that he made about the Latino community, accusing Latinos of being criminals and rapists, and his immigration thoughts about sweeping up millions of people and throwing them out of this country, unacceptable. His views on uh, Islam, uh, one of the largest religions in the world, and this unconstitutional idea that we can keep people who have a certain religion from entering the United States. All of those issues should be of great concern to every American and fighting to make sure that we remain a non-discriminatory society. We have come a long way in fighting discrimination, and we are not going back. We're not going to have a racist, sexist type of society. Uh, we've got to go forward. Page 292 of Our Revolution, President Obama is a friend of mine. I have worked with him on many issues, but on the issue of trade, he has been dead wrong. Yes, and not only him. Uh, in my view, when we talk about why the middle class of this country has been uh, shrinking, uh, why we have seen thousands and thousands of factories shut down over the last 20 years, uh, that has a lot to do with our disastrous trade policies. Uh, nobody should be fooled. These trade policies are created and written by corporate America, uh, by the pharmaceutical industry, by the big money interests. And the function of those trade policies, by and large, is to allow corporations to shut down in the United States, move to China, Mexico, and other low-wage countries. I helped lead the effort against the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I am delighted that that is dead. We need a new trade policy which benefits American workers and not just the CEOs of large corporations. Next call for Senator Bernie Sanders comes from Adrian in West Covina, California. Adrian, you're on Book TV. Uh, hello, Mr. Sanders. Um, We're listening. Please go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, I just had a question. Uh, I don't uh, really trust Donald Trump with uh, the people he has surrounded himself with, the uh, the whole uh, Council on National Policy people, the Christian Zionists, the War Hawks. And, um, and I just want to, well, first off, say to you that I agree with your... Uh, your uh, looks on trade and the war in Iraq and uh, your votes against the Patriot Act and things that, you know, you've shown that, y you know, you are what you stand for and you're, you're for that. But my, my question is, do you believe that's why you were uh, railroaded with the DNC because of your, your voting record and, uh, you know, the way you've shown that you stand for pretty much what's right? Look, uh, the DNC is part of the establishment. And during the course of the campaign, as I think many viewers will remember, we made it clear, we understood uh, which side the DNC was on, that they were not playing it fairly and they weren't playing it objectively. Uh, but we had to take, and this is important, and, and this is what gives me confidence in the future. In my campaign, and we talk about this a great deal in the book, we had to take on the entire Democratic establishment. We had to take on every governor, every mayor, uh, the entire Democratic Party in the U.S. Senate, with the exception of Senator Merkley of, of Oregon. Uh, very few members in the House of Representatives supported me. So we had to take them all on, and yet we ended up winning 22 states, getting 13.4 million votes, getting 46 percent of all pledged delegates, and, by the way, we ended up winning in every state the young people, black, Latino, white, Asian American, uh, Native American. So we had to take them on. I'm confident and I feel good about what we accomplished. Uh, but obviously, the political revolution has got to continue going forward. Our Revolution is Bernie Sanders' fourth book. And Book TV has covered all four of his books. Outsider in the House was his first in 1998. The Speech came out in 2011. That was his filibuster. And Outsider in the White House just came out last year. And now Our Revolution is out this year. Have you talked to Donald Trump since the election? No, I have not. Next call is Gene in Oakland, California. Hello, uh, Senator Sanders. Um, yes. I'm glad to see that you are taking 
leadership uh, in these uh, troubling and confusing times. Uh, we are very disappointed, you know, that you are not actually elected president. Uh, we have the opposite of you in the White House, and it's a very scary uh, prospect. You know, the next four years, God bless us. You know, my question is, uh, what do you think might happen to Social Security and Medicare um, under Trump? Uh, is there a possibility that uh, they may be privatized or gutted? And what can the Democrats... Look. Okay. The answer to the question is the American people overwhelmingly not only do not not only do they not want to see Social Security cut not only do they not want to see Social Security privatized what the American people want is to see Social Security expanded because they know that disabled veterans and senior citizens and people with disabilities cannot make it on 10 11 12 thousand dollars a year now Trump as I mentioned earlier during his campaign in order to get votes he said I Donald Trump I'm not going to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. But what I know, and I think you know, is that in the Republican Party right now, you have all kinds of people who are salivating at the prospect of cutting Social Security or privatizing Social Security, of converting Medicare into a voucher program. <coughs> so the question is whether Trump will keep faith with the American people, whether he will keep his word or not. But I will tell you, that we are going to do everything we can to rally the American people not to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Too many people in America today are living in poverty. They are living in desperation. They can't afford their prescription drugs. And we are not going to cut programs that are life and death for so many Americans. From our revolution, Senator, this is a sentence I think that Donald Trump would agree with. Our infrastructure is crumbling, one of the most important parts of your agenda was creating millions of new jobs by rebuilding our infrastructure. Yes, there is no question uh, that our infrastructure is collapsing, uh, that it's our roads, our bridges. I was in Flint, Michigan during the campaign and what's happening there with their water system is unspeakable. It's going on to some degree all over this country. We used to have the best rail system in the world, no longer the case. Airports are deteriorating, levees and dams. We can create, I proposed a trillion dollar investment over a five year period, which would create 13 million decent paying jobs. And Mr. Trump has been talking about rebuilding the infrastructure. I hope his ideas are not simply giving tax breaks to corporations so we end up privatizing our roads and our bridges. That would be a disaster. But if he is serious about rebuilding our infrastructure and creating jobs, that's a positive idea that we can go forward with. But I might add to this when we talk about infrastructure. Mr. Trump, during his campaign, told the American people that he thought that climate change was a hoax, was a hoax. Well, let me just be as clear as I can be. I'm a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment. I've talked to scientists all over the world. Climate change is not a hoax. Climate change is a threat to this entire planet. It is caused by human activity. And if we do not get our act together in the very near future and transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy, we're going to see more drought, more flood, more extreme weather disturbances, more acidification of the ocean. We are here in Miami Beach, Florida, more rising sea levels that will threaten this very city here. And Mr. Trump, I hope, I hope, is smart enough to know that he has to listen to the scientists and not just the fossil fuel industry. Time for a couple more calls. Steve in Larchmount, New York, go ahead. Hi there. Steve, we're listening, Hello? go ahead. Hi, I hey, am Steve, very how much in favor. Good, Bernie, and I'm very much proud of you, and I'm very much in favor of what you've stood for. But as a public, I think we're all asking for one thing. That is to all of us try to work together and reduce the rhetoric because the noise, because we need healing. We need to pull together. It's not the idea that it shouldn't be us against them or them against us. I think if we could all work together, I think all of us are smart enough to make it happen. What do you think? Well, I, I think, Steve, that there is much more commonality uh, among the American people than the media allows us to believe. 
Um, I'm not going to say that there are not people in this country, people who are watching this program, who are not going to disagree with me and others on abortion rights. I am strongly pro-choice on gay marriage. I believe in gay marriage uh, on a number of other issues. But on the other hand, Steve, if you look at issues like raising the minimum wage, pay equity for women. We just talked about rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, making college affordable for all of our all of our young people, uh, demanding that the wealthy and large corporations start paying their fair share of taxes. You would be surprised at how many progressives and conservatives share similar views on many of those issues. At the end of the day, if you're a conservative, you know, you want to see your kid be able to go to college. You want to earn a decent wage. So I think in many ways there is more commonality than the media allows us to believe. And Donna in Irvine, California, you get the last word with Senator Sanders. Oh, hello, Senator Sanders. We're listening, please go ahead. Oh, hi, Senator Sanders. Um, I uh, How are you? have a question. Uh, hi. Uh, the question I have, uh, congratulations on your book. I, I want to know, my question is, do you have any regrets? I want to add to that, I'm glad you did the book. Your, your phenomenal, um, mm, uh, anyway, leader. Do you have any, any regrets? All right, tell you what, Donna, we are out of town, uh, time, and let's get an answer from Senator Sanders on that. Well, I didn't quite hear the question, but Donna, thank you very much um, uh, for your, your kind words. Um, and I hope people take, a, take the time to read the book. And, and you know, what the book is about is not just the campaign. What we try to do in the book is give very common sense, practical solutions to the major crises that we face, the economy, health care, criminal justice, immigration reform, climate change, and so forth. So, Let's end with one political question. Tim Ryan and Nancy Pelosi, do you have a dog in that fight at all? Well, Nancy is a friend of mine, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tim's views of, oh, Tim Ryan, I'm sorry, please, uh, Paul Ryan. No, all no, right. no, Tim Ryan. No, I'm going to let, I was in the House for a number of years, but I will let the Democrats in the House sort that one out. Senator Bernie Sanders, Our Revolution, A Future to Believe In. Here's the cover of the book. In a little over an hour, Senator Sanders will be speaking live on Book TV in the Book TV room here at the Miami Book Fair. Well, coming up next call-in program.